welcome everyone. I see that Emil is in from Porto. I'm assuming that's Portobello. <laughs> um, so let me just share my screen. We're going to share Minecraft and I'm going to welcome everyone to this session about Minecraft Education Edition. As a brief introduction, my name is Stephen Reed. I have been very blessed to educate in over 70 countries worldwide using games and games-based learning. I use over 140 games, including Tomb Raider, Journey, Little Big Planet, uh, Portal 2, even Command and Conquer, the original Red Alert, I started with that. And I use those games to teach everything from the explicit curriculum and the core subjects of maths and science and art and history and so on, uh, right through to what we call teaching the tough stuff. I teach race relations, I teach gender equality, the refugee crisis, uh, sexual health, alcohol awareness with games like Minecraft and Papo and Yo. And so there's, there's almost nothing that we can't teach without... Uh, sorry, uh, without games. As, and using games is one, of the, is one of the most incredible things that I've ever seen used in education. I use lots of technologies like 3D printing, virtual reality, uh, coding, the development of artificial intelligence, uh, podcasting, animation, filmmaking, but by far the most powerful that I've ever seen is games. The reason we're talking about it here at the Creative Bravery Festival is because it's not always seen like that by everyone. It actually takes a bit of bravery, in some cases quite a lot of bravery, for a teacher to want to pick a game up. And we get why, because you know of the constraints of education, the pressures that you're under, the time, the cost, everything else that comes with this. But I'm here to show you that what is being proven time and time and time again, and we are now firmly in the age where game-based learning is being widely, um, widely accepted, particularly in Australia. Hello to the Australians, because you guys are bonkers for games-based learning uh, down there with a massive 32% of all of our esports, uh, Minecraft esports content consumed in Australia alone, um, which is higher than the American uh, uptake, which is incredible given the, the disparity in, uh, in population. And so, and the average gamer, for example, a lot of people say, oh, you know, gaming's for kids, gaming's for kids. Um, the average gamer in Western democratic countries is 32. The average Minecraft player is 24. And so what we've got is we've got a huge, uh, a huge buy-in at the moment for what is essentially games-based learning, but we understand why educators don't necessarily pick up and run with it. And so what I'm hopefully here to be able to do with you today is show you why you might want to pick this up and try it. Where is it you're going? Not the how and the buttons to press and the things you might do. That will come later on this week. But all of this week will be spent largely saying to you, this is where you could go with history. This is where you can go with maths. This is where you can go with a child's social and emotional learning. This is where we can help children to socialize, particularly during remote learning. So let me start. This session is going to be all about the big picture. Where can I go? What can I do? And the first thing I'm going to do is if no one's ever picked up Minecraft before, I'm using Minecraft Education Edition, but you can actually use Minecraft of any kind. Uh, Education Edition just happens to have education facilities built in, which if you're interested in working uh, going forward, I, uh, working for Microsoft, would love to help you with that. I'm just going to create a very quick world called Math Demo, spelling correctly, um, and I am just going to get it set up so that I am in the most basic space. So the reason I'm doing this is because I want teachers to look at this and say, oh, it's all just trees and caves and monsters. It's not trees and caves and monsters. It's, I'm gonna show you a canvas world. It's what I call the canvas world. And my kids love working on a canvas world. When I go into schools and I say, hey, everyone, we're gonna use that canvas world I was telling you about, they're like, yes. And if you look around, it's entirely flat. There are no distractions. It's like a giant piece of paper. If I float up into the air, there is nothing here. Maybe the odd animal, and kids love an animal. There's a sheep, there's a chicken. But what I can also do is I can go into settings. I can go down to show classroom settings and I can remove mobs. And now there's nothing to distract my children. It's like a blank piece of paper, a blank desk, a blank book. And then what I can do is I can say, okay, kids, what I want you to do is I want you to take blocks. Let's take wool, for example, and we're gonna do basic maths. So I'm gonna take these in color coordination order, because that's just how I am. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna do, if we have grids, everything in Minecraft is based on a block. So I can place a single block and I can attach a block to the side, 
to the top, I can go even higher and higher and higher. And if I destroy the ones below, I then end up with one up there, which I can attach to any side of. And so all of a sudden, we've got this immediate, this is just left click, right click. We can just immediately build anything we want. That takes a little practice, but believe me, it doesn't take much. But what if we were then to do numbers? What if we were to say to the kids, one, two, three, four, five, add two. It's basic mathematics, key stage two, level two, I think, in Britain, uh, in, the, in, the, in the English curriculum. And so all of a sudden we have this counting system. What if we did percentage? What if we wanted to do, whoops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oops. What percentage of that row is yellow? Now what percentage? What if we did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10? It's the same mathematical piece, but it's just not the right, sh it's not the same shape. And so the children are now, so we're just getting young children to puzzle through maths. Um, what if we did symmetry? So I say, okay, then I'm gonna dig a hole here. And that's just me digging and then replacing with wool. And then I'm gonna do this. And then I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna dig out the empty space. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And all I want my children to do is finish that space. Just finish it, just make it symmetrical. Don't copy it, make it symmetrical. So suddenly we're doing really, really quick symmetrical stuff. So the kids would then go, right, okay, yellow, 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 and then orange, orange, orange. And it's just like a pencil. And children know how to use this. Children are faster than I am with Minecraft. So this is like drawing to them. Like you can see how I'm literally drawing with 3D objects. Um, so think about the possibilities beyond mathematics. But I want to stick to mathematics for the moment. Because then what we can do is we can then, if I just, that was, that was just the principle of how easy it is to start a basic flat world and then have your children begin immediately with mathematics. Because quite often teachers will say to me, I don't know how to get started. That must take hours. It takes seconds, literally seconds. Now I'm gonna move you to what that looks like because I want you to understand the why. The why is important. So if we head over here into the middle of this beautiful world, now you don't have to create anything quite like this. I can provide you with these worlds, but this was a world that we made for the Northern Irish, Northern Irish curriculum. Uh, many, many years ago, I think back in 2014, we made this and this was, uh, all based on math. So the kids start in the Pie Castle. And then while they're inside Pie Castle, they then decide where, what they want to go and study today. So they can go to 2D, 3D shapes. They can go to tessellation, symmetry, or grid reference. So we're going to head over to symmetry. And when they come outside, they see the big symmetry area. And if I fly up into the air, you'll be able to see that everything is mathematics. Three times one equals three, just built in big numbers there. And then this one is zero plus three equals three. And there was a little girl said to me one day when we did this, she said, they're all three. I said, what do you mean? She said, the answer, six divided by two equals three. They're all three. And I said, right, there are more than one ways to make three in maths. And she was like, ah. Oh. So then she went off and she had this list of all the ways you can make up three in maths. And she did it just inspired by Minecraft because it was there and she took that as a challenge that I didn't give her. But if we head over to symmetry now, she, see, you know, she sees the butterflies. <gasps> butterflies! I say, right? Butterflies are symmetrical. They don't, have, they don't have different wings on either side. Why is that? So then we go and explore it. And as you get to the other side, you'll see that we've created a yellow, uh, sorry, a green island, an orange island, and a purple island. The green island is examples. So you've seen some of these already create a basic symmetrical shape using two colors of wool. What if it was a triangle? What if you used glass to create the line of symmetry? What if we finished a pattern? What if we had a shape that wasn't quite what we expected? Use green wool, I give them the yellow, then I say to them, use green wool to finish the pattern for me. I can, get, I can tell you when you're right and I can tell you when you're wrong. What if I just gave you the points and you showed me all of the ways this could be symmetrical? and so on and so on. What if I gave you numbers and then you used glass to show me which are symmetrical? And so on and so on. And before you know it, the kids have got it. They've just gone over and over and over symmetry and then it's a platform that they love. It's in a, a tool that they're familiar with. It's a literacy, it's a physical and mental literacy, this game for them. And, but we're turning it into maths. 
And then if we head over here, we have Symmetry Castle, where I give them this incredible build and then I say to them, using a piece of wool, like orange wool, find all of the lines of, of symmetry. Draw that for me. There's another one there. This is a nice line of symmetry here. So the kids would draw the lines of symmetry. We could even say that maybe, maybe what about this one? This one's symmetrical, look. And if we draw this one, we get to the top and we realize, oh, actually it's not. That's not symmetrical, that's not right. And so then we start, so we're doing assessment. Immediately within there, our assessment, our orange island is assessment. And we can have the children go do that. And then the purple island is, tell me where you struggled. Tell me what you liked. Tell me your own ideas. Build for yourself. And we give them this building platform that allows them to then become the learners and the, and the teachers. And the peer, peer assessment, ultimately. Look what I did. And we can do the same for tessellation. We can do the same for 2D, 3D shapes. We can do the same for grid referencing and beyond. How do you make maps? How do we understand X and Y axis? We literally use Minecraft's own grid referencing to make maps. And we've got a green island to show them how, an orange island to assess them, and a purple island for them to make their own, and so on. And so we built that for the Northern Irish curriculum. But then one of these, there's one thing that's missing in there, and there's three magical ingredients to all of the worlds that I've built over the last 11 years. I've been using Minecraft for 11 years. This is my 11th year. And one of the things that's missing, it's got the right environment, which is your first thing. It's got the right structures and mechanics, which is the second thing. The third thing is narrative. How do we build a world that tells a story that makes our children want to do maths or science or history? Everything's a story for me. I grew up being told stories and telling stories. And so mathematics is a story. It only ever made sense if it was. I didn't understand those questions in maths where they would say, you have five bananas and someone gives you two raspberries. How much fruit do you have? Why on earth are we talking about fruit? I'd rather have a really nice narrative about my story. And so in this case, we have a narrative. We have a mysterious lighthouse that you can't get into. And there's been a plane crash and the plane has crashed on the side of the island and you are the sole survivor. Suddenly the kids are thinking, oh, what's on the island? And then they meet this chap here. Here's the plane crash. And they meet this chap here, Dr. Wells. And Dr. Wells says, I'm so glad you survived the crash. I hope you can make it to the city for the antidote to this disease. And the kids are saying, what disease? One of the three paths follows a path pattern and lead you through the forest to the train station. There's a train station. The others lead to disaster. Every kid wants to know what that path leads to. Take this iron sword with you for protection. Watch for zombies. So suddenly we've got a disease crashed on an island. There's a train station we need to make it to and there's zombies. And so what we then have is we have the maths. This is this blue path. It's all about number recognition yellow path or the green path. They all have different number systems. This one starts with four, that one starts with six and goes on from there. Take this one, for example, two, four, eight, 16. And the kids start to recognize patterns. Some of them have similar patterns, but then they stop or they reverse and the kids have to work it all out. But if they choose the wrong path, so it's just, again, young kids trying to get them to follow uh, mathematics, but they love it. And once they follow it, they get to this guy. They find the right path. And Matt has says, oh, you made it through the forest. Did my friends, Dr. Wells, escape the zombies? Go and help us with the electrical power. So then they head on and here's the zombies. And this is why they took the sword, because there's zombies everywhere and they have to fight and attack them. And, they, they're, and they're under siege and there's barbed wire and it's just the whole scene is set. And then they head to, this must be the electrical system. And anyway, long story short, they go in here and they fix the electrical meter. They clear the place out with zombies. And then they fix the electrical meter by doing grid referencing. This is where they now do grid referencing. They have to switch these levers. So if I get this right, that one. Uh, no, it must be that one. Yep, puts on a second light. And if they get the right grid referencing, 10 by 10, they will switch on all of the lights which will open this door, otherwise it doesn't open. I'm not gonna do that because it will take too long, but if we head out here, you'll see that that door leads to a train station where there's a third maths puzzle. And then the third maths puzzle lets them across the train station where they discover the city. And the city, all of this time, has been held in the giant hand of a zombie. So they're actually literally on a zombie island. And somewhere in that city, which is chapter two, because we do this in chapters, is the antidote but the city's already under siege. The buildings are falling apart. There's overturned tanks. The zombies have already won. And so you become the hero of your own story. So they start on the elbow and they make their way to the hand. Children 
love this. Children beg to take this home. Can I please take that home and show my parents? I can do all the maths again. Teachers say to me, I've never ever had my students ask me to take maths home. Um, I'll show you a world in a, in a moment that, that, that we do the same with literacy. So again, all I'm doing is, I know this looks like big stuff. If you're not a Minecrafter, you're thinking, how on earth? Believe me, this stuff is not as difficult as it looks. Your children will do a lot of it with and for you. And there are also uh, companies, um, Minecraft mentors, there's MIE experts, lots of people out there from the Microsoft perspective can help you do it too. But I want you to see what's possible for your classrooms. The successes we're seeing globally are, are second to none. But let's, uh, let's try this one. I'm going to take you into a world. This is what I call my portfolio world. But I want to show you the probably the most successful and complex system of mathematics we've been doing. In this world, we have religious and moral education, where we have Muslims and Christians building worlds together, where they celebrate each other's uh, um, they celebrate each other's places of worship. This, this cathedral was built by Muslim children who wanted to know all about it. They had the holy water and there was some funny moments. Children have, do funny things where one little kid said, they're not allowed to research and they're not allowed to ask an adult. They have to ask each other. And so one little Muslim child turns to a little group of Christian kids and said, what's holy water? And this little Christian girl turned around and said, it's Jesus and you do that with him. And, and, and so we have but this is that's that's wonderful storytelling because then the, the the muslim kids were like i don't get it so then we talk about it and they had the pulpit and they have the candles and they have the bread and the, the the iconography and the colors and everyone sits in rows and everyone kneels for prayer at which point you then get over to the uh the the mosque built by the christian kids who then went in and there was another funny moment where they went in and they, they, they built it facing the right direction. They built all the windows and the lights and the mats, the prayer mats. And then one little Muslim boy said, but there's not a separate place for the women to pray. And the little boy said, yes, there is. I put some pink mats down. And so we had to have a chat about that. And, um, and so the, the, they just, it's, it brings us together, this gaming. It does the most wonderful things. And, and what they also did, the commonalities, they were like, oh, so we all kneel to prayer. We all believe in a God. We all have a book that we read. We all go to a place that we pray in and so on. And suddenly you're talking about the commonalities. Over here we have logic gates. I won't go into this in detail, but all of these are redstone logic gates, and gates, or gates, nor gates, XOR gates. And this one down here, we can see that we've got solar power, wind power. And if we attach this all to this and gate, you'll see the light at the very end, this lamp here. If I switch any one of these off, that light goes off. So this is an AND gate. It will only work if this one and this one and this one and this one and this one are switched on. So we can create physics gates that allow children to understand how electricity is processed and made. There's a hydro dam up there, which actually works. That hydro dam powers this city. There's a postal service, there's a university. This is called blockonomics, there's recycling. We have children live in this world 25 minutes a day and they have jobs or they're unemployed. There's affordable housing and non-affordable housing. There's a hospital, there are, there's a mail service, there are plots of land, there's a bank, they deposit money. They make, uh, they, 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 they make money or they save money or they owe money, like I am the banker. There's agricultural domes that make food, which then take them straight to supermarkets. Children have to buy their food and understand how much that costs. There's gas stations if they want to own a car. They need road tax. They need to pay road tax or I go around and put holes in the roads, like in Scotland. And then even when they pay tax, I don't fix them. Um, <laughs> sorry, that was an unnecessary dig, um, but I hope someone's listening. Um, we have museums that they curate. We have cinemas that they can visit and make their own movies for. We have uh, refugee crisis housing. Uh, we have construction and every single thing. If they want to build with oak wood planks, it's five pounds per block. If they want to build with concrete, it's two pounds per block. If they want to destroy something, it's five pounds per block. And then we have spreadsheets and they do entire mathematical models based on budgeting buildings. You want to build a new house? You tell me how much that's going to cost and why. Every window, every foundation, every door. You tell me what that's going to cost. Um, and this is what's called blockonomics. We have children pay interest and rates and tax and they run hotels and they make profit and loss. Everything done inside here. And in South Africa, there's a company called Real Life for Kids. And they do this on paper and we're moving their model to blockonomics. So South Africa, look out for that. It's coming your way. Um, so this is, this, the, the, this is ultimately the world um, 
the big mathematics model. Now, all I've done just now is focused on maths. Let me show you some other stuff. And I'm conscious of, I've got plenty of time. That's good. I could talk about this stuff all day. Let me take you to what we call our toy box curriculum. And now the reason I call it this is because we loved toy boxes when we were kids. The idea of being able to go rake in the toy box and you rake the stuff out and you find the thing you wanted to play with. This is the thing I wanted to play with today. My Star Wars figure was the thing I was looking for. That Gamorrean guard, I knew he was in there somewhere. And so what we do is I make toy boxes out of curriculum. This one happens to be a huge toy box. You'll notice that there's nothing else. We create what we call void worlds where we take everything else out except the focus of the lesson. And then we've made this big Viking shaped box as if it's been opened up and out of it has come this diorama of, of Viking life. And then this is where we start to teach. Which toy do we want to play with today in the Viking world? Do we want to do geography? And we can look at the fjords and the geography of Viking land. Why was it not as arable as most other places? Why? Because of, because of its height. Why did they want why did they come to Britain in the first place? They came for land. People think they came for riches. They came for land. They wanted to be able to plant food. They were part of the agricultural revolution of our civilization and needed to be able to survive through growing food and settling. People think they were unsettled. They were very settled or would have been if they could be. What about their style of housing? They used trees. So anywhere they settled, they needed trees. So we can do maths. If we know that every single tree is made up of blocks of wood, take this one, for example, one, one, two, three, four, five. There's five blocks of wood. How many blocks of wood will it take to make the basic frame of my boat? If I know that my boat has to be, let's assume that one block is a meter, I need a 20 by five meter long boat because that's roughly what they were. And if I know that by taking this piece of wood and putting it in here, I get four planks of wood. So one piece of tree equals four. So now we're doing our four times table. So we can actually do... We can build way more if we just chop the wood down and manage it properly and so on. So then we build the boat. So we're doing mathematics rather than the geography of the fjords. And then what if we did, there's a little agriculture, how and why did they farm? So we can literally farm real crops. Then we can meet the people. What if we go over here to these NPCs and we meet them and we say, hi, my name is Freya and I am the god of farming and war. And then we can meet the gods. And if we do this, let me just go into teaching mode. We can change the dialogue. We can put whatever we want. We can change this. The, the, let's make it look like this instead. Let's give it a name. Let's call this guy Tjorborn. And then this time we have a different character and another cat. We can have children fill spaces with characters that they want. We can even create separate creatures like the golden boar that Freya came to, to Earth on. What about the the longhouse what did the longhouses look like there's the fire this is where the arrow would have sat this is the table where they would have made merry after battle and so on we can tell rich historical stories about history or mythology the reason there's a hole in the side of the box was because the kids knocked a hole in the side of it because they said vikings never stay in the same place so they broke out of their box which i thought was really neat um and so on we can do literacy science maths geography, history, language, currency, clothing, culture, food, anything we want in that toy box. We just need the toy box, which will be available very shortly free on the Minecraft Education Edition website. If I want to take you further, I'm going to show you Pompeii. So another toy box model, because you think, oh, that's fine. The Vikings one was great, but we can do this in any way we want. So if I take this one, you'll see is slightly different. Now we have a Roman box and we want to look at Roman culture. And on the side, just like the Viking one, we had the memorabilia. People, the kids are like, what does SPQR mean? Let's go find out. Why were the Roman shields beveled? Why did their swords not look like Scottish swords? What's that? What's that? You know, these are archways. These are pillars. The Romans were famed for these things. Let's go find them. These are the tools they would have used. Um, then let's look at, on this side, we have a fire extinguisher, just in case the volcano erupts. It doesn't work, of course, but the kids love that. We've got, um, we've got the, the entire city then in here. So we have a, a gladiatorial arena. We have a school. We have a public forum. We have a private forum where they would have stood and talked to, you know, politically. And then we have the public forum outside. We have temples. We have poor districts. There's the temple. There's the poor districts. Aqueducts bathing houses. We even have a languages tree where you start with the root. The kids start with the root word. So the root word in this case today is, root word is com to mean together in Latin. So let's look at the branch word, community, which means a group of people together, come together in unity, community. And we can start to teach children about the 
the, the origins of their language and not just not just the English, but the French and the Italian and the German and so on, and how they, how they linked to the origin of languages. Down here we have a school where we have the teacher, but we also have a pedagogus. People don't realise this, but the pedagogus accompanied children to school and was responsible for how they learned, not what they learned. That was the teacher's job. The teacher put it on the board and talked about it, and the pedagogus learned. Uh, sorry, taught the, the, the children how to learn. He was also, he, she, were the only people allowed to raise their hands to the child. Tended to be rich families that had it. You could almost call the pedagogus a slave. We have a theatre over here where we do live theatre. But what we haven't talked about is Vesuvius. Mount Vesuvius sits at the back here. And we have it all almost as if it's in the process of, of, of being set off. But if we head round the back and we look, we have a section. We've sectioned it off and we've sealed it and the kids can go and do geography of, um, is it volcanology? Volcanism. One of those is Star Trek and one of those is geography. Um, but we can, do, we can do that, right? And we can help the kids. What we can also do is if we press the C key and we select, it happens to be built in, eruption. This is a piece of code, if I, I can make it in JavaScript as well, but this is a piece of block code that the children can manipulate. And if I type eruption into this world, which I think I'll do, you only get one shot at this. But if I type erupt, here we go, I'm just gonna have to do this. I don't know if I'll, I'll be able to fix this world now, but anyway, type uh, eruption. Oh, I got that wrong, spell it correctly. Uh, why is that not working or is it? Sometimes it works and it doesn't necessarily say it's working. Let's go back into C, let's press play and then type eruption. Oh yeah, it is. And then the ash is falling from the sky. I'm not doing any of that. The ash is falling from the sky and eventually 30,000 pieces of ash will cover the entire city. And then after, oh look, the volcano is erupting now. So suddenly the volcano is erupting and the lava is pouring out of the volcano and it's gonna come down and it's gonna burn the city. And if the children leave this, the whole thing lasts about 10 minutes, but if the children leave it, the city is covered in ash random fires start to burn and the city burns. We developed this with children. I didn't make the code, children did. And the children can then go in and they can make that happen. So using a simple piece of code that is pre-built into the map, we can automatically show children what happened on the day that Vesuvius erupted. I'm gonna save and exit that world and I might just be able to save it. Save the people of Pompeii, like Doctor Who did. Now, um, we're then gonna head off to, we've done that, we've done that, we've done that. So, since we're doing this in Scotland, I'll give you a quick sneak preview of a Scottish space where we actually look at Perth Castle. So here's our Scottish toy box. There's the broadsword stuck into the ground at the end, and on this side we have the paint and the water and so on. We have the farming, we have the houses, very different. We have the different style of box. And then over here we have Perth Castle, which now stands on, uh, in, the, in the city, uh, the centre of the city of Perth, pretty much where the conference, no, the, is it a conference centre? The theatre anyway, the big, um, the big convention centre is in the middle of Perth. And so we have, we can study Scottish culture. We can also do World War II, where the students avoid artillery and they write letters to each other and they do, and let me show you World War II. Then I'm going to show you renewable energy and art and that's where we're going to finish and I'm going to take any questions and maybe show anybody anything that they want to see. So in World War II, this is a toy box. It's just a, a it's actually, I think this one's a briefcase. It's like an old World War II, uh, yeah, an old leather briefcase. And inside there is the World War II memorabilia. We can change these flags. It doesn't have to be the German flag. It could be the French flag, uh, the, 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 the Italian flag, the American flag, the Russian flag. You can do this um, World War I or World War II. Um, if we head into here, World War I, you would meet Manfred von Richthofen, and he would say, during World War I, pilots started by flying reconnaissance missions, but eventually graduated to dogfights. Let's have a look at what he means by that. W, uh, World War I aviation. This will take us to a BBC.com website where we can learn about the viewpoint, how World War I changed aviation forever. And so just by clicking on an NPC, we can take our children out of Minecraft and into a website. But what if we didn't want to do that? What if we wanted to take them to a notes page where it takes them to a OneDrive, where it takes them to a Word document where we have a preset Word document that they can now start to fill out. They just 
sign in, they download it, and then they can start to do that. What if it takes them to a OneNote where they can start to just take their own notes with their own pen if they're on a touch device or something like that, and then send that to you as the teacher. In fact, you as the teacher don't even have to have it sent to you. You're probably getting it as an assignment um, or sending it out as an assignment and having it sent back to them. So we can link Minecraft immediately to other forms. You can then go back to lesson selection and you go back to President Woodrow Wilson, who says in this toy box, you, and the reason we did that was because this was uh, made from, for an American uh, client. Let's go to Morse code. Samuel Morse says Morse code was invented in the 1830s. Each code is associated with one letter. We can learn about it and then we can solve this Morse code. What do we think that says? dot 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 dash 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 dot 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 and then we can go over and the kids can get further instructions use any means necessary to build a telegraph machine that will communicate a message in morse code and we can do that here's a basic telegraph machine let me show you a lamp a piece of redstone um, and also a lever oops if I put a lamp down and I put a piece of redstone and I do this with a lever, dot, dot, dash, dash, dot, dot. We can do Morse code. With a little engineering, with a lamp, some wire and, and a light, we can do Morse code. Now let's imagine there was another child 20 blocks away looking and going, oh, okay, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that, I can do that, and we pass it on and we see if the successful message made it to the military base on the other side. Did we get reinforcements? Ah, you started by saying, we need help, and, and it ended on the other side with, we're getting hell. Okay, reinforcements may very well have arrived, but the message was different, um, and so on. And, and then at the very end of this, the children write letters. So then what we do is we give them the book and quill for those watching who want to do a little literacy, and you can do this in any language, we can do this, we can say, dear mother, it is cold here in the trenches of the Somme, whoops, and the German guns, Huns, are a pain in the ears. Right, and we can do, then what we can do is we can even get a camera and we can get ourselves a little camera and then we can go and take a picture of the German guns. And then when we go back to our book and quill, we can go into the next page and we can add that picture of the German guns. German trenches. And what we now have is we have a book. And if I sign that book, whenever I'm finished with it, it can have up to 50 pages. But if I say, Sergeant Reed, this is the story of Sergeant Reed and the letters that I have written to my uh, mom. Now, here's a great exercise. Any teacher out there, particularly the UK works uh, and Europe works particularly well, go to any antique shop and ask for letters from World War One and Two. Believe me, they have them in bundles and you can buy them for a few pounds. My mum used to do it. And then she used to find out who they belonged to and send them. I found these in a shop. I believe they belong to your great, great grandfather. Here, have them. And I'd go into the house sometimes. And my mum would be crying and I'd be like, what happened? And be like, he died. And I'd be like, okay, okay. The letters just stopped. Okay. Oh, it's all right, mum. And we'd wrap them up and we, she would then go onto these genealogy sites and she'd find out who they belonged to. Great exercise for kids. Let's trace real history, but let's copy the letters. Oh, I've made a mistake, but it doesn't. Well, it's in, it's, there's some German there. Um, uh, and we, put, in, uh, and we put, the, put it in the book. And then what we can do is we can then send that book. So what we can do is we can go get ourselves a chest. And inside the chest, we place the book. Imagine a library, a digital library of World War I history and stories just in a, in a world. And all you have to do as the teacher is visit the world, go to the chest, open the book, and it's all there. Anyone can do that. That book, that becomes permanently a fixture, a feature. It cannot be edited. It's in there now. And then we have a poppy field, lest we forget. And we encourage the children to stop and think and ask questions afterwards about why we do things like that. Why is it important to remember things? Because we're always doing the social and emotional as well. I'm going to save that there. Uh, then we do, but that's, the, I mean, so we've done history, we've done mathematics. I want to show you another toy box just before I move on to art. Art is really important and I'm going to finish with that because a lot of people think, well, that's great. You can do all the, the kind of the, the structural 
uh, ones, if you like. But what about art? What about drama? What about music? Surely that's not possible. Um, I've even been challenged quite aggressively by art teachers to prove it. Um, this is another toy box. This is a more modern toy box, which is renewable energy, where we've literally worked with children to make a working hydroelectric power dam. When it rains, the reservoir fills up and the light comes on. When the tide comes in and the tide comes out, we get enough energy. You see the tide coming in and out. That's all electronic and all mechanical. And then if we head up here, this light is on. This light is only on because we have tidal power. This light is not on, as you can see, it's dull because we don't have enough water to create water pressure in our dam. Now, if I make it rain, and I'm just gonna do this, weather, rain, it will start to rain and the reservoir will start to fill up. As the reservoir fills up, this light will eventually come on. I now have to hope this works. <laughs> Just got to hope it works. <laughs> Let me go double check that one of our mechanics is working. Uh, it's one of those things where you turn your back and it goes on. But I just want to check that one of our mechanics is working. So the reservoir, even though it's not technically filling up, because Minecraft doesn't work like that. There's a cauldron. It's going to take a while. So what I'm going to do is fill it with water just so you can see. Let's just imagine this is just our model. This is where the children understand that if this works and we fill it with water, we should, by the time the rain falls, fills the cauldron up, which essentially is a model for the reservoir, we should end up with, there we are, electricity generation. Imagine this was a house. So we can, we can power houses by having full reservoirs, which then create water pressure to turn turbines. And you can see there that the water is now, we have what's called overspill. So we can teach children over time, we can teach children complex scientific and climate theories by building models for them in Minecraft. And then I think time-wise, because I've got another nine minutes, um, I'm going, it's 50 minutes, right, Helena? I'm right? Yeah, great, don't wanna go over. I mean, I'd love to, but I'm not gonna. And so um, I'm gonna finish with art. Um, I've been challenged, whoops, screen sharing has stopped. Oh, why is that? Oh, Minecraft crashed. Dun, dun, dun. This is part of the brave story, Stephen. I know, right? Let's be brave, we can fix this. Uh, any questions in the chat while well, we're, uh, I'm reloading. I think there's been some wonderful feedback, um, lots of stuff about storytelling. I suppose my challenge is just um, to everybody to think about your brave takeaway from this session. I think this session has so much to offer and, and certainly from, from my point of view, I love, there were some beautiful things that just aligned directly with the whole ethos of the festival. Become the hero of your own story. Yeah. Uh, I love the purple platform where you share, where you learn, you know, we're, we're talking to our young people to learn something and then help us, you know, the digitally illiterate like myself, you know, how do we learn from them? Um, I, I just love the, the toy box. Mm, uh, mm. My son is, is 20, 21. It's hard to remember. He still has these Star Wars figures. He still has, but he, he plays Minecraft and, and he absolutely loves it. Brilliant. Like Iron Man. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. So if everybody, you know, just to hit this final part now, yeah. what's your brief takeaway from this session? And mm. I think you still, there's still something really interesting coming here, Stephen. Absolutely. And whatever, whichever, wherever you are in the world, whichever country you are in, uh, particularly, I mean, I, I live in Scotland and sadly Minecraft is almost exclusively not used in Scotland. Um, Fife Council has it but hasn't enabled it. Um, North Ayrshire Council doesn't have it and won't sign off on it. And it's bizarre because I'm using it in over 70 other countries worldwide. Um, the Swiss, the Austrians, the South Africans are crazy for it. The Canadians, the Americans, uh, the Senegal. I've just been commissioned to work in Kenya and Rwanda on uh, Kenya will be celebrating all 32 tribes through culture in Minecraft and Rwanda. Uh, we're doing a curriculum for reconciliation in Minecraft, telling the story, very bravely telling the story to young children of their, uh, their genocidal history. And, and we're going to be doing that through Minecraft. I've just completed John Lewis' world called Good Trouble, all about Black Lives Matter um, and so on. So in this one, basically what happened in this story was a, a, a teacher said to me, I, 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 my, my major is in art. And so a teacher said to me, um, I don't believe it can be used. Apart from some pixel art, I, I guarantee you, you cannot use art 
at Minecraft to teach my subject. And he was quite aggressive about it, actually, I will say. I won't tell you where he was from, um, what school he was from, but he was quite aggressive. And I took that as a personal challenge because I did art as my major. And so what I did was I built an art gallery in which you can come in and you can visit Michelangelo and the Masters, Claude Monet, or P.A. Mondrian. And if we head over into Michelangelo and the Masters, each place, like we can go to the master staff who say, in this room, you can explore the paintings of what was known as the Renaissance, the Golden Age of Art, and the Masters. And then you can, there's the Mona Lisa. And we can, we turn them into puzzles for the kids and the kids can fix and they can say, I know what that painting is. And then they have to work out and we can do it in different orders and all sorts. Now I need to work out what it is. There we are. And then some are not named, so the kids have to go and find out what painting that was. And then other ones, of, of course, are named and who they were from and so on. And there's the, the Last Supper and et cetera. And the, um, there we are, the creation of Adam. How many pixels is God away from Adam? Three pixels. It's unbelievable. Um, and so we do that and we have questions, we, you know, and even like gender, I think one of the questions over here, no, nope, that was the, there's a gender question in here. I think it's this one is, um, note that most of the paintings in this room were painted, oh no, that's not the one. There is a gender one saying, why were they all men? There's no female paintings in this room at all. Ask why. Then we go into the Sistine Chapel and what we did for this one was, we created a one to 17,000 scale replica of the, the Sistine Chapel for our children. These are the exact frescoes that belong on, that are on the walls of the fresco. Of, now, not like the paintings, they weren't recreated as art pieces. They're actually, if I turn around to you, you'll see they're block by block. This is gray wool, this is diorite, this is andesite, this is wood, this is nether brick, this is dirt. But when we zoom back, they are the exact frescoes that are on the wall in the Sistine Chapel. And so the kids can be here. They can visit the Sistine Chapel. They can see what it was like. They can look at the floor. They can ask questions about it. But more than that, hidden around the room are multiple Michelangelo's and they can literally meet Michelangelo. Ciao, I am Michelangelo, an Italian artist who lived during the Renaissance. I was a sculptor, painter, poet and architect. And then we click refresh book and when we go in the chest, that book I told you about last time is in there. I created many pieces of art, paintings and sculptures for Pope Julius the second and then we have pictures and we have I built scaffolding for the job and bent backwards to paint over my head often i was a contemporary of leonardo da vinci we're teaching children everything that they're being asked to remember when it comes to exam time and let's face it sadly that's all what we've all got to do but we're doing it in such a way that they're in the sistine chapel with michelangelo and then their job paint the ceiling get up there we've made the ceiling grid referenced in glass get up there and paint the ceiling with blocks. And so they do, now they don't paint frescoes, they paint minions and, and Zelda characters, but they paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. So it's a, it's a real job for them to do. If we head into number, I'll just head straight over to number three, we then meet P.A. Mondrian. P.A. Mondrian, a Dutch abstract artist who did things like this with amazing titles like composition <laughs> or black and white composition three. What a guy, honestly. But we also head into, finally, we meet P.A. Mondrian who says, in the next room, you will find yourself inside one of my paintings. And we go inside a composition. And when we go inside the composition, the children choose the place they want to start. And we give them a real canvas. We give them real red, yellow, blue, and black paint. And then they say, right, this is my P.A. Mondrian. And they paint it. And then meanwhile, the girl next to that little boy, it says, no, 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 this is my P.A. Mondrian. And another one's saying, no, 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 that's my P.A. Mondrian. And before you know it, there's no single P.A. Mondrian that comes out of that that isn't, that is the same, sorry. So we can get children to paint P.A. Mondrians by making their own in Minecraft first. And they can add bits if they want to make it more P.A. Mondrian. But then they have to take the 3D and turn it into 2D. And they love that part. And then finally, if we head into the art, uh, Claude Monet's art studio. We head into, bonjour, I am Claude Monet. I'm an impressionist from France. And then here uh, he painted these wonderful impressionist paintings, uh, self-portrait with a beret. There's another great title. I like this one, San Giorgio Maggiore at dusk. And then we head in here and we can see all of his paintings. I think Ewan McIntosh is in, he'll appreciate this. He's a man of France. I saw him, uh, I saw him in earlier. And then this is, uh, I wanna show you this one. This is a woman with parasol. Claude Monet, 1875, and they can research these paintings. But here's the thing, here's the thing. If we head inside outside, 
It turns out that this whole time, you were just the size of a fly in a model of a museum on the floor of Claude Monet's actual studio. And the P.E. Mondrian is, the is in the cupboard and the Sistine Chapel is in the wardrobe and you're actually just a fly in his, in his studio. Here's his real paintings made of millions of pieces of blocks. There's Lady of, uh, in, as, in Parasol over there. There's his paint brushes and his bucket and mop and so on. This was always just a model to help children learn. Then we have clues. There's a wedding ring, there's letters, there's a painting that doesn't belong to him on the wall. There's a cup, cup of coffee, there's yellow tulips, there's a self-portrait of him um, and so on. Hidden around this room are four ninja turtles, which you have to go and find and the kids have to then work out why they were named Leonardo and Raphael. Here's an actual painting of the man. And then down here, we have you find multiple cases of him. This is just a mystery. It's like a, not a murder mystery, it's a life mystery. Who was this guy? Why is it, who was he married to? Who did he write letters to? He actually wrote letters to his contemporaries and in particular Manny. And that's why there's a Manny on the wall. And that, that lesson is called one of these things is not like the other. Um, and you can go find it. This was one of the, he loved Persian rugs. Here's a Persian rug that he had on his, he wore a flat cap. There's the berry on the wall, uh, on the coat stand hanging there. The children piece together his life. And then they have to then write a report on what they've discovered. And then the final exercise at the very end is there's a class set of easels over there and they have to, they have to make uh, their own painting. They have to paint their own face on the easel as a class set of 30. Make your own, using pixel art, make your own impressionist impression of your face. Um, and they do that. I reported this back to the teacher in question who said, I'll take Minecraft for every, every single art teacher in my entire cluster Tomorrow, thank you. <laughs> so you, you've literally changed the way I see the way art can be taught. And we can do that for drama. We have theatres that children can go into and they can play in huge theatres and they can set the stage for themselves. We have worlds dedicated just to music where you can put in notebooks and you can, when you press a button, you get a note and there's sharps and all sorts of stuff in there. We can make any world you want. No, 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 I'll correct that. You can make any world that you want. I'm going to stop for questions while I find the other theatre and let's just see if anybody's put anything out there that I want to, that they want to ask. Any, any questions, any thoughts, any feedback? Anybody want to give this a go? I'm going to put my details in the chat. I think we're, 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 ru we're running close to time. So we are actually, I think we're over. Even. I'm just keeping an eye on some of the other events warming up. Um, if there's any questions coming through, certainly in the chat room, it was lovely to see um, do you know, Aunt somebody, Jer I think it's Kerry there saying she's on school holiday for two weeks. She's going to be playing Minecraft. Um, I would really encourage anyone, if you've got any ideas or thoughts of how to use this, head over to the Ideas Playground and post them. Um, certainly, and th let us know what your brave takeaway is. Working in a college, I think that, you know, this is really a, a, a challenging thing that colleges and universities should be looking at as a different way of delivering online. So, yeah, Stephen, what, what you've shown us is really, really encouraging. Well, thank you. I'm actually just putting my details in. Um, if you're serious about be, taking the next brave step, I will happily get you started. I actually work for Microsoft as a customer engagement PM and I can work out if you already have links or have access to our technology to be able to do that. Otherwise, uh, follow me on Twitter. I'll also give you my email address um, and we can kind of go from there. I think you've got one last bit to show us, have you, Stephen? Or... No, I would, no, I do because we're over. I'm just going to, time-wise. I am here all week though, nine o'clock every day, Tuesday to Friday. We're going to be showing you crafting the past. We're going to be showing you the refugee crisis. We're all Minecraft all week. And I know you've been looking at the festival field too. Ah, yes, yeah, sorry, you're right. I did mean to say that. We are, we're not quite finished that yet, but this week, stick with us because we have built the festival field with the circus and the rooms and oh, it's incredible. And we will be launching that midweek, probably Wednesday or Thursday. We will have that ready and lit up and good to go. Okay, that, that's brilliant to know. So um, if you fancy actually three-dimensionally going inside the festival field, yes. Yeah, we'll let you know on Twitter or uh, on any kind of email or whatever when that will go live and you can have a look in it. And that'll be uh, available for all Minecraft, Education Edition, Bedrock and Java. So anyone can then just go do it. 
And what we love about that is for you to go in with your pupils into the festival field and, and have a look around and, and even from that to use it as a discussion to, you know, how should the field develop, what, what should happen. So tell us, head over to the Ideas Playground, tell us what your brave takeaway is. On, on behalf of all the team, uh, Stephen, when I first met you at the campfire, I kept saying the words, holy moly. I don't even, I've never used those words before in all my life, but somehow they came out. What you, sh you showed me and what I've saw seen today is absolutely blowing my mind. Great. Thank you well, for- let's, let's see, I hope we can use it to change education. Let's change that paradigm, particularly with remote and hybrid learning models. COVID has shown us that we need to start looking at new models of education. We have to, or we're toast. And we, this, is, this is one of the ways we can do that. So let's get brave about it. So thanks to everybody for coming along. Well done, Stephen, you're an absolute star. Thank you. Our brief was Creative Bravery Reimagines Education. What a start to the festival in terms of a bonfire. You have lit the sparks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So 12 o'clock.